What's up, everybody? It's April Justine here with Strictly Shorties, your podcast for everything short tails and blood pythons. I am super stoked today because we are going to talk about a question that I get all the time. People private messaging me asking me if I have this snake and I pair it with this other snake, what am I going to get? So we are talking the basics of genetics today. And what better person than to have is Travis Wyman. Travis, say hello, please. (laughs) Hi, everybody. (laughs) I don't know why I'm waving at a camera that nobody's going to see, but hey. I know we're not using the video for this, but it's okay. At least I could see it. I'm good. (laughs) All right. So Travis, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of your background in reptiles and why you are the one that should be speaking about genetics. Uh, Well, I guess first, how far back do you want me to go with my experience with reptiles? However far back you want to go. I mean, well, I guess like everybody, I got started. Well, I guess not everybody. Most everybody, I got started real young. Um, I was five. I was on the playground. I flipped a rock. I found a baby garter snake. I stuck it in my pocket. I brought it back into class. That didn't go over terribly well, but he got to come home with me and I kept him for a little while and then we had to let him go. And it was a terrible, horrible, heartbreaking experience for me. I remember drawing the picture of me crying as I let him go (laughs) to express how sad I was over him. Um, And at that point, I was pretty much hooked. Uh, Spent most of my formative years, you know, catching garter snakes in the field across the street, at the pond, down the way. Um, Discovered later that you can actually buy these things, uh, you know. (laughs) Killed many, many anoles, um, got better at what I was doing and learning and stuff. Then my father, he had a pet shop just around the bend from his house called Tropic Seas, which was a very exotic fish and reptile place. And that was where I got my first real legitimate pet animal. Um, It was an albino corn snake. I was 14 years old, it was $150, which was a lot of money for, you know, a 14 year old at the time, a lot of money for a corn snake at the time too. Um, yeah, seriously. <laughs> and that, when I say that was my first legitimate and like serious snake purchase, that snake made it through junior high, through high school, through college, through moving, getting married, having a kid, getting through grad school, moving again, you know, professional career, getting a divorce. So he made it to 23 years. Oh, wow. 23, 24. I don't know. He made it, you know, mid twenties. Um, and he, you know, like I said, he saw it all. He lived it all with me. So that's really where the professional in a stance started. Um, and I guess a little bit professional in terms of how my life and career sort of tapered out, um, which I guess dovetails nicely with how we'll go (laughs) with why I am fit to be talking about genetics with you. Um, but still keeping with my reptiles. Now I keep a fair number of different things. Uh, about half of my collection is ball pythons, mostly because not, you know, because I'm chasing the dragon of, hey, ball pythons make me millions and millions of dollars because they don't at all, ever. Um, but because they are just kind of an infinite palette to play with. And I like, you know, playing Dr. Frankenstein with the colors and the patterns and everything. Um I also keep all kinds of just weird out of left field things. So I get my more normal ones would be my Brettles pythons. And then I got some Alterna. Um, But then I get into the weirder things. I have beaked snakes, which you're familiar with. (laughs) Yep. And you have have baby beak snakes. I have some baby beak snakes. Yes. It's exciting. (laughs) Um, I have kukri snakes. I have rubber boas. I have calabar boas. And I just recently picked up some Scaphiophis, which are proving to be very difficult to get established. But oh, goodness. this is what happens when you work with bizarre import animals that are not well known is sometimes you struggle and the struggle is real. But 
part of that struggle for me, at least, is if I can get species that are odd and weird into the hobby, then maybe we can worry less about having to import things and more about maintaining nice, stable, captive populations. Um, you know, it was the same thing with the beak snakes. I, I admit that I very poorly picked them up on a whim because they were really cool when I was sh they were shown to me, but I they were fresh little baby captive hatched, you know, imports, and I crash course myself hard on things when I want to figure out how to get them in, and so I learned everything I could, and I got them established, and then five years later, you know, I took it full circle, and I hatched a clutch of babies, so I do know what I'm doing most of the time, but sometimes <laughs> you still crash and burn, and Feeling a little of that right now with the Scathiophis, but I also know a lot of other people who have gone the same way with them, so I know that I'm at least in good company. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so professionally, I am a PhD in microbiology and molecular genomics. So you know, going back to the albino thing with the, or going back to the corn snake thing, it albinos have always been a fascination for me. Um, that's why I picked up the albino corn snake. You know, I've, over the course of time, I have had albinos of all kinds of things. Uh, albino horned frogs, those little grow a frog things. I managed to convince them to send me an albino. My father had <laughs> a fish tank when we were growing up, and I would convince him to get like the albino loach sharks and things like that. Just I always liked the albinos. And then, you know, as you get into science and you start learning that albino is this genetic trait, then you kind of, well, when you're me, you kind of like, oh, hey, the, the albinos come from this genetics <laughs> thing. Maybe, maybe I'll learn more about genetics. And so I just kind of kept falling down the rabbit hole of genetics and things. I went a little divergent because one of the other things that I like is, you know, microbes and viruses and bacteria and things that can kill you and stuff. Um, you know, I read The Hot Zone. I thought that was really, really fascinating. Um, <laughs> and so my my genetics studies sort of drifted that way, which is how I ended up with microbiology and molecular genomics. Um, but fundamentally, genetics is genetics and is genetics. And what at least on a basic sense, works for the genetics of a bacteria also is the basics of genetics in you and me, our snakes, our cats, our dogs, or whatever. Um, so I have a very broad understanding of genetics from my formal education. And while I did focus a lot of that on little teeny tiny things and what they do, it still applies mostly across the board, especially with the stuff we look at in our, you know, our hobby of, you know, if you mess up a gene, it has a specific phenotype. These are our mutations. These are our morphs. You know, I can then take it to the stupid level of, well, is it a mutation that's a frame shift mutation or a promoter mutation or an insertion deletion mutation and, you know, stuff that nobody in the hobby really thinks of because none of them are as deeply immersed as I am. But sometimes having that perspective can help me explain some of the odder things that we see or, you know, even the basic things that we see that people just kind of overlook. Like why, if you take a T plus albino and mix it with a T negative albino, you're not going to get anything super special. You're just going to get something that looks like a T negative albino, you know, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are like, but you're combining two different albinos. Yeah, but if you've got a T-positive albino, you have some pigment. And if you have a T-negative albino, you have no pigment. So if I put no pigment on top of some pigment, I still end up with no pigment. <laughs> right, right. So you're going to end up with nothing. Right. Genetically, and, you would still have the T-positive, but... Yeah, you know, genetically, you still you have a T-positive, but you know, morph combo wise, mm -hmm. you've got a T negative. So why waste all of your time doing that one in 16 when you could just do the one in four? Yep, that is true. All right, let's bring it back a little bit. 
Um, and let's talk about the basics of genetics um, and some terminology. You went over some terminology here, but the most common terminology I think that we have in the snake world is the heterozygous and homozygous, recessive and complete dominant. Can you go over some of those type of basic terminologies that uh, we hear a lot now? Sure. Okay. So recessive, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll flip back a little. Heterozygous and homozygous. Um, that is referring to the genetic state at one specific location, usually when we're talking about things. So if something is heterozygous for a trait, it means it has two different alleles. And an allele is just a form of a gene. Um, one of the easiest ways to think about that is like suits in a deck of cards. So you have the ace of hearts, the ace of spades, the ace of diamonds, the ace of clubs. Heart, diamond, club, spade, those are your alleles. So if I have two ace of spades, I'm homozygous for the ace of spades gene. If I have a spade and a heart, I'm heterozygous because I have two different types of aces there. Okay. So het means two different types, heterozygous. Homozygous means two of the same. Um, now, when this becomes more relevant is if you're talking about the inheritance pattern of a mutation. And there are two types of inheritance. That's really kind of important because people like to think that there are three or four or there's not. There's really just two types. There is recessive and there is dominant. Now, a recessive gene or a gene that is inherited recessively is one where you have to be homozygous for that gene to see a phenotype. So albino is the classic example of this. If I have one copy of the albino gene, the animal looks normal because the normal gene that's there produces enough melanin that it covers up the fact that I am missing the other melanin producing gene. If I'm lo if I lose both of them, then no melanin is produced and the animal is an albino. So that's a homozygous recessive animal. If it's heterozygous recessive, it still looks like the normal animal. Now dominant is the other form of inheritance. And what that means is if you get one copy of the gene, you will see a phenotypic change. Now, this gets a little bit more confusing in terms of whether something is incomplete dominant or simple dominant. Simple dominant means if I have one copy of the gene or two copies of the gene, the phenotype is the same. So with humans, a really easy one, but not like everyday type of seeing thing is your blood type. You can have a blood type that's AO, or you can have a blood type that's AA. You're type A blood regardless. Um, one that you kind of see every day is hair color, though. Blonde is recessive, and anything else is dominant. So if you have somebody who has brown hair, they could be brown brown genetically or they could be brown blonde and those people will end up looking the same because the brown hair gene is simple dominant incomplete dominant is a little bit different where if you have one copy of the gene there's a change in the phenotype that you can see so you know that something has happened but if you have two copies of the gene there's another phenotype so the inheritance is dominant, but the expression pattern is with one copy, the dominant trait is there, but it's incomplete as to when you have it with two copies. So this is what we call like the incomplete dominance and then the super form. Right. We call, we call it the incomplete dominance and the super form. And really what it is, is that the incomplete dominant is the heterozygous form, and it has one visual phenotype. And the super form is the homozygous genotype, and it has its own uh, phenotypic expression. Which I think is really cool. And having the incomplete dominant gene and you're playing scientist, I think, is so strong. You have so many different possibilities you can do with the different combinations and stuff. 
Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm coming off of her cold and so my throat's all freaking funky. <laughs> All right. So those I feel like are the basics. Now, how do these genes get passed down to animal from their parents? Well, when a mommy snake. <laughs> okay, we don't have to go out. into that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be a smart ass. That's what I am. Um, so we all have two copies of, of you know, your genetics, your chromosomes. And you got one of those copies from your mom and one of those copies from your dad. And you will pass on one copy of yours to your children, assuming you have children. And then your spouse, whatever, co-parent, yada, 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 (laughs) will pass on half of their chromosomes. So with humans, we have 26 chromosomes. I give 13 to my kid. My wife gives 13 to my kid. Now we have a kid who has 26 chromosomes. Half came from me. Now, that half through just random selection could be a quarter from my father and a quarter from my mother to go with a quarter from my wife's father and a quarter from my wife's mother. It could possibly be the exact half that my dad gave me, I give to my child. It's very, very limited chance that that'll happen. But, you know, there's a chance. Um, So it's just a random segregation under normal circumstances that will give you half of your genes came from each of your parents and half of your genes will go to your child. Okay, that's pretty simple enough, I think. Um, How can we then predict, I guess... I don't know, maybe I'm make stepping too far forward in this, but, you know, if you have a mom that looks one way and a dad that looks another, and then how, how can you predict what the baby's going to look like? Statistics. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, assuming that you are working with simple Mendelian traits, one gene, one phenotype, then it's basically a matter of just you know, kind of a, a back of envelope math, back of envelope statistics equation, which is we know that half of the genes going into the baby come from each parent. So say that the dad is just a normal wild type parent. And we know his genetics then are both wild type genes. But the mom is a visual albino. So both of her genes are going to be albino. You breed those together, each baby is going to get one wild type from the dad and one albino from the mom. So all the babies will be hets. They'll have one wild and one albino. And it doesn't really matter which wild or which albino they get from, you know, dad and mom respectively. They'll just be one and one. Now, if mom and dad are both het for albino, Now you have a situation where you have dad's wild and dad's albino and mom's wild and mom's albino. And we plot this out as a, what we call a Punnett square. You just take those and do a two by two graph and your possible combinations then are mom's wild with dad's wild, which gives you a baby that is genetically wild type and looks like a wild type. And then you can have dad's wild with mom's albino or mom's wild with dad's albino. And those two babies are genetically heterozygous, but both of them phenotypically look like wild type normal babies. So now you have three babies that all look wild type, but there are two different genotypes there. And then you have dad's albino and mom's albino. And if those come together, you get a baby that's albino. So your odds then would be one normal or one wild type, two het, and one visual mutation. One, two, one. Um, And, you know, that one, two, one ratio kind of applies across the board, at least in terms of the genetic factor, but it doesn't always play the same with the phenotypic factor, because if we go back to incomplete dominant ones, 
Now, if you breed two incomplete dominant animals together, you know, the mom being wild and the dad being wild still gives you a wild baby. But if mm-hmm. you get the wild dad and the mutant mom or the wild mom and the mutant dad, those two babies are going to be the heterozygous. So they're going to have the incomplete dominant phenotype. And then if you get the mutant mom and the mutant dad, that would be the full or the super form homozygous mutant phenotype. So you still get the one, two, one, but now you have a visual representative of it where you've got the one wild type, the two incomplete dominant and the one homozygous dominant. And they're, they break down genetically one homozygous wild, two heterozygous, one homozygous mutant. So when you're working with recessive, you get two looks. And then when you're working with the incomplete dominant, you get three looks of the the clutch or the babies that you get. Yes. And, and then that's where we get dominant. You also have two looks, but it's sort of uh, an inverse of what you would see with the recessive, where only the wild type is visual as the single look because the wild so, type and the wild type come together. But if you have wild type and mutant and mutant mutant, those all look the same. So now you have three that look the same, but two different genetic types there. So what would be an example of dominant gene in the reptile world? Cause I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, I honestly can't tell you about any of the short-tailed pythons because I don't work with them. <laughs> um, the ones that spring to mind are in ball pythons. Um, pinstripe is dominant. It appears that the, uh, the leopard gene is probably dominant. And possibly the acid gene and possibly the calico gene. Okay. I I say possibly with those two simply because there haven't been enough breeding trials done or made public done in the first case, made public in the second case to show one way or the other. Sure. Sure. And, and, And that might be honestly the case for blood pythons too, in that people are working on it, but are still experimenting with the different clutches and we just don't have enough babies to really figure out what we're really seeing. So that's totally possible. Um, now bringing it back to the short tails, um, the blood pythons themselves, the recessive for them is going to be the albinos, the T positive and the T negative. Can you go into the difference between the two albinos? Yes. Um, it's really simple. (laughs) T positive and T negative. So the T in those, terms refers to tyrosinase, which is a critical enzyme in the processing and the biomanufacture of melanin. So if you are tyrosinase negative, you lack that enzyme, you are 100% incapable of synthesizing melanin. So any mutation that prevents you from having tyrosinase makes you T negative. So that would be a mutation that deletes the gene that it may not delete the gene, but it will break the gene such that the enzyme does not get produced or genes. If you think about it, it's kind of like a road. Almost all genes have a traffic light at the very beginning that tells you go or don't go. Mm -hmm. If you break the traffic light, then there's no way to regulate it. And if there's no way to regulate it, you never get to go down the road. So shut down the gene that way. You never make the enzyme. You never make the enzyme. You never get (coughs) melanin. A T positive gene or a T positive albino is one where Tyrosinase is present, so your mutation is not to the tyrosinase gene, but the whole big long pathway, which is depending on the organism anywhere from 4 to 16, I think, steps, anywhere along that pathway you can break and you either don't get 
enough melanin produced or, you know, to fully pigment the animal or the melanin gets produced, but it does not get delivered to where it's supposed to go or it gets produced and it's unstable. So it breaks down, you know, so your tyrosinase is present, but the melanin is still not being produced at a normal level. It may be produced at a just a reduced level, which gives you some kind of pigmentation. It may be produced at a level that's so low that the animal itself still looks like a complete albino, like it is a T negative albino. Um, and, you know, that can lead to confusion in some other species like uh, boa constrictors. You've got the sharp albino and the call albino. Well, both of them look, you know, like you would think a T negative would look, but only one of them could possibly be a T negative because they are not compatible. If I breed a shark to a call, I end up getting wild type looking babies. So that tells me that it's not the same gene. Um, you also see this in retics and birds. There are a couple of different kinds of out, you know, mutation that'll give you a yellow and white snake. If you breed them together, you don't get a yellow and white snake back out of it. Um, so that's T positive is you get the tyrosinase, that critical starting enzyme made, but somewhere else along the chain, it gets broken. I like to think of it as like T negative takes out absolutely all the black pigment and then T positive takes out part of the black pigment. So it's, and in most cases, yes, that is correct. Right. So Although, like I said, there are those rare exceptions like the, the boa, the berm, the retic. And I'm sure, and I wonder, um, if like the mocha and the sunset Borneo, I know when they, those are two recessive T positives, different lines, and they bred those together and the animal look like a T negative. So is it actually a T negative or would it be something like that? Did they breed <clears throat> two double heads together or did they breed two visuals together and the combined visual? Ooh, I want to say it's two double heads, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. So what they ended up probably getting there was the double visual. And, um, you know, that's the reason it looks like a T negative is because of you're you're basically combining the reduction in the pigment. So um, a real easy way to think about this is imagine, you know, like you said, the black coloration. If the black coloration is food coloring, you know, go into your baking cabinet if you're crazy like me and you bake <laughs> and get the red food coloring out and just squirt that whole thing into a cup and then fill the cup with water. OK, call that your fully pigmented animal. OK, now you said the mocha and sunset. Yep. OK, which is darker? Uh. I'm not really great with Borneo, so I don't know. You can pick one. <laughs> okay. Well, for the sake of argument, we will say that the mocha is the darker one. Yeah, it might be. Case, yeah, like said, this is for the sake of argument. I'm, you know, I, I have openly admitted I'm not a short-tailed python person, so don't have everybody come hating me saying, well, God, no, it's the sunset that's dark. You should know that. Okay, I don't. It, it's moot for the point of this argument or this explanation. You just change the names and the explanation is the same. So if we say the mocha is the darker one, then the mocha would have half of the pigment level. So now take that cup and pour half of it into a new cup and fill that up with water. Okay, now that's going to look lighter because you have removed half of the pigment from there, right? Mm -hmm. Now set that cup to the side for right now. Go back to your original cup. We're going with sunset. Let's say that the sunset has got 20% of the pigment or 25% of the pigment. Mm -hmm. If you take the half that's left and pour half of that out into a new cup, now that's 25% of the pigment. Now fill that up with water and that's your sunset. So there you can put your pig, your mocha pigment cup next to your sunset pigment cup and see that they're different because the mocha is darker than the sunset. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if you're combining both genes together, some people are like, well, that means you just pour both cups together into one, but that's not correct. What you're doing is you take that sunset cup and you pour half of it out and then you fill it back up because you're removing 50% of the pigment that's there because that's how you got the mocha. It wasn't the fact that you poured off half, it's that you refilled with half of nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you take that 25% and pour it off and now fill it up, now you've got 12.5% pigment left, that which is going to be really, really, really faint at this point. Yeah. Now, I just used 50% and 25% because those are real easy numbers to get around. What if your mocha is actually 30% pigmentation and your sunset is 7% pigmentation? Then it's going to be even lighter. What's Right. What's 30% of 7%? No idea. At, at, I, right. <laughs> it, it's so dilute at that point that you've basically taken everything away, which is why the animal then is going to look pretty much like a T negative. <clears throat> now, my guess is, is that animal ages, it will start to get some degree of pigmentation such mm -hmm. that if you took a true T negative and laid it down next to the double visual you'd be able to pick them out because, sure. you know, even if there's just that slight percent that's still being manufactured, over time there will be enough accumulation versus the T negative is not going to have any level of ac accumulation. <clears throat> that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, so, so that goes into bloods for the recessive for bloods. We talked about the recessive in Borneos because that's the sunset in the mocha. And then we go into Sumatrans, and that's also the caramel – which is the T positive orange head Sumatran, and they um, have a caramel look to them, hence caramel color, um, or the caramel name. <clears throat> so those are all the recessive that I am aware of. The rest of them are incomplete dominant. Um, I kind of want to list off the incomplete dominants. They're, this is not all encompassing by any means, but I just want to give the listeners an idea um, so they can kind of play with it and understand what what uh, pattern mutations or color mutations go with what type of um, genetic, um, what would it be called? I don't know. What is it called? Like it's genetic, um, like <laughs> words, words are hard. <laughs> what? Inheritance? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, here comes a cat. Here we go. Uh, yeah. So um, what type of inheritance tense it is, and that way they can kind of play with the science of it, mm -hmm. and they can look up um, the Punnett squares, and they can kind of mess around with it to see what uh, different babies they can make. So um, with blood pythons themselves, we have the golden eye. And then the super form of that will be the magpie. And we have the matrix, and the super form of that is the ivory. We have batik, and the super form of that doesn't have a name, but it would be super batik, and that's actually a patternless animal, and it tends to have little tail kinks. It reminds me of the zebras and carpets, uh, carpets because it's patternless, and they end up getting kinks. Um, then you have the pollen which the super form of that is the flower, and that's kind of like a stripe pattern going on there. We have zigzag, we have slack line, and we have raw iron. And then we also have stripes. When we come to stripes, you have animals that have stripe patterns, but you have genetic stripes as well. What is the difference with that? I mean, so animals that have a striped pattern. <laughs> there, with some animals, there is just this natural tendency towards striping. Okay. Which means there is a, some type of genetic pathway there that leads towards, towards this striping pattern. And then if you alter the expression of that one way or the other, or select for some number of genes that select that are 
that push towards that patterning, you can enhance or decrease it as you see fit. Um, but then you can just get the straight genetic factor that plays into it, which, you know, if there's a pathway that exists that, say, controls how pigment is distributed in a straight line down the body first, and then it cascades from there off the sides like a waterfall, mm -hmm. well, if you keep just that first pathway where it goes straight down from head to tail, but then you break the pathway that says, and then once you've pigmented along the back, waterfall down the side. Well, if I break the waterfall path, you just end up with an animal that's got a nice stripe across its back. Okay. Now, it's possible to have both of those pathways intact, where first you have the striping, but then like, maybe I don't break the waterfall pathway, but... I make the weakest waterfall here and the weakest waterfall there and the weakest waterfall, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F genes all contribute to how the waterfall looks. And instead of breaking it, they're basically like putting up little dams. Okay. And so there's still maybe some degree of waterfall coming over, but so much of it's dammed up that the animal still ends up looking like it has a nice stripe down the back or it's got not as clean or perfect of a stripe as a genetically striped animal would, but it still has a distinct stripe because you found other genes that act to stop or slow that water falling down the side. And then that's something that you could like line breed for, right? Like yes, if you, you could have, line breed for that. You would have a, an animal that, like I have a couple animals that the babies just happened to be more striped animals. So if I take those and pair it with animals that tend to be more striped, in theory, I would get, you know, more striping in the pattern. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is the, the heart of selective breeding or line breeding is that you are picking, they may not be strictly Mendelian genes, or they may be, but they're not, you know, hugely dramatic Mendelian genes. Like, you know, albino, boom, albino is obvious, but, you know, say that, you're, you find an animal that's a little bit lighter than normal. And so you keep it because you really like lighter than normal animals and you breed it to a different lighter animal. And from that you get babies that are even lighter than their parents. And then you keep those and you start doing that over time. And you're selecting for a whole bunch of genes that lighten the animal. While any one of them by itself does not cause a dramatic lightning, all of them piled up together cause this dramatic lightning and that you know that goes back to the the sunset mocha thing mm -hmm. you know that's an ex a more extreme case because you're picking two that cause a dramatic lightning but if you picked 50 genes that all caused you know a two percent lightning you still end up at that same end point at the end you know so if you really like striped things and you're just picking animals that have stripes over time you're picking genes that contribute to the stripe factor and those genes then just start to accumulate to the point where you're just producing a lot of stripey animals because those genes are enriched in your collection um, okay and i often say that people's collections are genetic for this reason you know i have a lot of different looks that i like i like you know with ball pythons, I like stripes too. I only work with, I guess, two genes that drive towards striping. But that said, I have a lot of animals that are not genetic stripes or cypresses, and they still have a lot of striping to them because I have picked animals. You know, when I bought an albino, there was the albino that was really banded and there was the albino that was kind of striped. So I leaned towards the albino that was kind of striped because I really liked that stripe look on them. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody else might like the banded thing. So then they're, they're choosing animals that don't have striping. And then way down the line, I end up with really nice stripey albinos and they end up with really nice banded albinos. It's not that our animals are two different kinds of albino. It's just that my collection is so full of stripe genes that I end up with this stripe phenotype in almost all my animals. They're so into banded genes that they end up with a lot of nice banded animals in their collection. 
And then the example um, with short tails would be a really great one is the granite and the marble in Borneo's because those are said really to be the same gene, but one person took the gene one way and selectively bred for a certain look that they liked and another person took it another way and they didn't communicate, didn't talk to each other, didn't know each one was working on it. And now we have two completely different looks, but really it is the same thing genetically. So maybe the same thing. (laughs) Maybe. I mean, again, without knowing exactly what they are, like it may have the same initial basic gene, but all the other accumulated little fiddly bit genes that go along with it that are changing that look to it contribute to the fact that, you know, these may have both started at the same place, but they've drifted over time with how they've been propagated outward. That makes absolute sense too. Absolute sense. Um, Should we get into the more complicated of the Borneos and... I know you don't know short tails a lot, but I know you know enough to know that Borneos are very unpredictable and yeah. you can put <sighs> one dark colored animal with a light striped colored animal and get something completely different. Um, so how do we kind of wrap our brain around that and have an idea of kind of what is going on when we're trying to just understand what's going on with the Borneos themselves? So that's really kind of just an extension of what we were talking about. Um, mm-hmm. So most everything we see with the Borneos, to my understanding, is what we would call polygenetic or polygenic. And that just means that there is a lot of genes that play into the phenotype that you see. Um, and, you know, it it's kind of easy to think about this by just think about everybody out there that you know. We're all people. We all look pretty bloody different, though. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Um, But at the same time, like, if you took a whole bunch of... Don't crucify me for saying this, people. I'm not advocating for it. I'm simply making the obvious analogy. If you do the Hitler thing, where you take a bunch of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, and you put them together, you're only going to make blonde-haired, blue-eyed babies. I could say the same thing of if I take a bunch of people with brown hair and green eyes and breed them together, I'm just going to end up with a bunch of people with brown hair and green eyes. Now, if I take the brown hair, green eyed people and mix them with the blonde haired, blue eyed people, I'm going to get a whole bunch of different things because then I'm combining a lot of different strange genes together that weren't together in these little populations. You know, and that's what we see with the Borneos is, you know, well, I like this Borneo that's got, you know, a wider stripe and darker color, but the stripe is light. So I'm going to find other Borneos with a wide light stripe, but darker side patterning. Somebody Mm -hmm. else is going to be like, I don't like striped Borneos. I want really busy (laughs) Borneos, but I want them to be orange along the sides. Is orange a color in Borneos? Yes, yes, it is. (laughs) Okay, I want them to be orange on the side. So I'm going to look for really busy, crazy Borneos that have orange on the side, and I'm only going to breed them together. And eventually what you're going to get is this guy over here has got really just bold, shocking, high contrast, light stripe, dark sides. And this guy over here has got these, you know, mandarin orange with browns and dark chocolatey puzzle pattern crenellation looking because they just kept choosing all of the genes that contributed to that so it's not just one gene that contrib that makes the look yep. but you enhance and enrich that so much and then if you breed one animal from each collection what you're probably going to get is a bunch of weirdly mutt looking things um well that's a good way to look at it. You know, mutts. Um, there's this huge fad for designer dogs these days, designer yeah. breeds, which, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, people, they're mutts. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Expensive mutts. Welcome too. to actual genetics. Yeah, they're mutts. And you have just <laughs> been, you have just been swindled into buying a mutt for thousands of dollars when really you could have just made the mutt yourself for significantly cheaper. But I digress. Um, <laughs> if I take, you know, Obviously, through hundreds and thousands of years of selective breeding, we have ended up with giant walking fluff balls that we call poodles. And then we've ended up with big old stupid mops, which we call golden retrievers. Yep. 
And then we breed them together and we get golden doodles. And all golden doodles basically look the same. Neither really like a golden retriever, neither like a, you know, but neither, you know, neither of them look like a poodle, neither of them look like a golden retriever. They just like, like kind of some ugly mishmash between them. Now, what they tell you you're not supposed to do if you like golden doodles is you're not supposed to breed two golden doodles together because the babies won't end up looking like golden doodles. Hmm. That is partially a lie. Okay. If you breed those animals together, about half of them will actually look like golden doodles. But the half that don't, some of them are going to look more golden retriever. Some of them are going to look more poodle. Now, if you keep just selecting that half that looks like golden doodle and constantly breeding them together, Mm -hmm. then you're just going to keep refining those genes that make them look like golden doodles to the point that golden doodle becomes a stable breed and you don't have to worry about it anymore because everything that they make is golden doodles because all you're doing is keeping those golden doodle traits together and you're flushing out the things that make them look more poodle or more golden retriever. That makes sense. You know, so it's that's that polygenic factor is it's a whole bunch of genes that make them look like golden doodles, but you can you can refine it to keep those genes together and flush out the ones that don't look so much like golden doodles. That that really truly does make a lot of sense. And that's um, all you did to get golden retrievers and poodles in the first place is they bred doggy one to doggy two, proto poodle one to proto poodle two, and they kept choosing those genes that made them look more and more and more and more and more like poodles. <laughs> yeah, that poodles. I am really glad that you use dogs for that because that like truly makes sense on how this this works and how people are are getting what they're getting and how different borneos some looks are more consistent than other looks and and that that makes sense um and why when you know if like matt minatola i know that he's known for his borneo animals Mm -hmm. if you just buy one of his and you breed it to something that doesn't look at all like his animals and then you're like, well, why didn't everything look like what Matt breeds? Well, it you, it doesn't look like what Matt breeds because you did not strive to maintain those genes that Matt has maintained for all of this time. You bred it, you know, you bred this high quality Matt animal mm-hmm. to, you know, just a regular old whatever that you picked up off of another table that didn't have a lot of thought put into it. You can't be surprised that the animals you didn't get out or the, the animals you got out did not look like what Matt Matt's animals look like. Yep. If you want them to look like Matt's animals, you either have to keep breeding them to animals that look like Matt's animals or, OK, I bred it to another just normal Borneo. Now I have to take those babies and keep bringing them back around and in to maintain and bring back the high level of those genes that make them look like Matt stuff. You know, you got to put that work in or you have to keep that work in. You can't just go for broke. Right. And think that you're going to make Matt's awesomeness by just having one of Matt's animals. Right. So, so something Matt specifically, he works with Ocelot, um, the Ocelot look, he, which is a, um, the sides are, have, have very low pattern and kind of like dots kind of going along the side. Um, and then he has white wall as well. And then he has that extreme marble look that he has um, gotten as well, which I have a couple siblings of the extreme marble look because I want to get that look <laughs> that Matt has. So uh, I think I'm on the right track for that. Um, other Borneos too are ghost. And then you have the blue ghost, you have latte and you have fade. You have granite, which has the speckling on the side, just as marble has the speckling on the side. But like I mentioned earlier, um, they started possibly at the same line and now have a different look to them altogether. We have side swipe, we have super stripes, we have ultra brights, and we have stripes. And then the mocha and sunset that I talked about before. Now, like I said earlier in this podcast, this is not um, all encompassing. We are finding new things. And with Borneos, because it is polygenic, we 
have tended through history of uh, the Borneos in captivity. We've named them after the, what they look like, not so much that they have a specific gene, but whatever the babies, the look that comes out of them. We have leopard because they look kind of leopardy. Um, we have tiger because they have more tiger striping, you know, that type of thing. So it's not so much that it is genetic, but it is what the babies look like and how they were described. Um, so They're that described as the morphotype rather than, you know, the actual. And that's how we describe <clears throat> most of our morphs. I mean, that's where the word morph comes from is a, a bastardization of the term morphotype. You know, like an albino, an albino is describing a phenotype. It's not describing a genotype. That's why if you want to get into the nitty gritties, yep. a lot of times you will see people screaming and yelling at each other that, you know, like there's what they call an albino Doberman out there. It's not, it's, it's, it's a leukistic Doberman, mm -hmm. but they call it a T positive albino because most people are used to seeing albinos in mammals where they're white so they yeah. say, like, your ball python can't be an albino because it's got yellow in it. It's not all white. Well, no, it's an albino because it's the same gene that's knocked out as an albino koala or an albino kangaroo. It's just koalas and kangaroos only have melanin. So when you take away the melanin, they're all white. Sure. But when you take away the melanin from an animal that has more than just melanin, like snakes, like birds, like fish, mm -hmm. then you see those other pigments that are still there. And, you know, different sections of, of animal keepers will like they will argue and fight this to the death about how, well, no, your animal's not an albino. Well, yeah, it is. You know, and you can kind of tell who has a grounding in classic genetics because the people who have a grounding in genetics are like no it's an albino because they're the same gene that's knocked out and then you have you know just the i don't know the paint jobbers i guess we'll call them who are like no because their colors are not the same that means that they're different you know they would call our our blue-eyed leukistics and our black-eyed leukistics and things like that they would call those albinos because well they're all white so sure. it works sure sure Interesting. And here's a, another question that someone brought up recently. Um, and this has to do, oh, there's also pides in blood pythons that I completely forgot to mention. Um, but uh, someone was mentioning that, so we have pides in, in bloods, we have pides in berms, we have pides in retics, we have pides in balls. That genetic look is recessive in a lot of different animals. So do a lot of different species Okay, yeah. like help me explain this. Do a lot of different species, do they have the same gene? It's like the, the batik in bloods kind of works the same as the zebra does in carpets. So it's not the same gene because these are obviously different species, but how, how can we kind of compare these or correlate these? Because I've seen people do that, and I don't know if it's accurate. And uh, yeah, it I don't know if it's right. It may be the same gene. Um so albino is a very easy one to talk about. Again, albino, a lot of things go, e albino is easy to discuss because a lot of things are albinos and people are super, super familiar with it. The albino gene in ball pythons is exactly the same as the albino gene in Burmese pythons. Well, one of the albino genes in Burmese pythons. And we know this because if you take an albino ball python and you breed it to an albino Burmese python, you get albino berm balls. Okay. So, so you know that it's the same gene mm -hmm. because if it was a different gene, you'd get double head animals. The yep. same way if you take a normal albino and a lavender albino ball python and breed them together, you get normal looking animals. You know that's not the same gene then. Um, so yeah, in some cases across species, it is the same gene. Um, you know, the... The zebra and carpets in the batik. Yep. You know, because their phenotype is very much the same, you know, you've got the the very busy, chaotic look in the single gene form, and then the double gene form is a complete pattern wash. And I'm guessing that the batik being a patternless animal, it's a patternless light animal, right? Yep. The same way that the super zebra in 
carpet pythons is a patternless light animal. It's not like, you know, patternless zebra in carpet pythons is not all black. So, you know, Mm -hmm. just based on the assumption of how it behaves in carpet pythons, I could say how the super batik would look. That could be the same gene. Now, I don't know anybody who has been suicidal enough to try and breed a carpet python. It'd be such a confused animal. <laughs> it, would, it would be a horribly, horribly messed up animal, but... It would be so confused. If, if somebody could do it, like, aside from the whole, what the hell Frankensteinian monstrosity did you create? Just in terms of answering the pure genetics right now, if if you bred them together and you got a patternless animal, you would know that it is the same gene because if it wasn't the same gene, you wouldn't get that patternless behavior. Um, now, I say right now because that's the simplest way to do it, even though it would probably be horribly complicated to get those two animals to lock up and breed in the first place. But Potentially so. <laughs> there, there are a couple of groups that are looking at... Um, you know, identifying mutations in ball pythons mm-hmm. on the genetic level. Um, ben Morrill and Hannah, I can't remember Hannah's last name right now, but she's the ball python genetics project. If you want to look her up and Hannah, forgive me if you hear this and I've forgotten your last name. Um, but they are like literally genetically identifying the specific genes. So if one or the other of them or some other group decided to start looking at it in either carpets. Well, it would require both carpets and the Borneos. Then you would be able to look at the genetic sequence and be like, okay, well, we know that it's, you know, gene XYZ in carpets. And then we did it over here and it's also gene XYZ. So since it's both gene XYZ, we know it's the same thing. Yep. Um, that makes sense. But yeah, it you know, sometimes it's just it's supposition, but it's often correct supposition. You know, we know that the supposition with albino was that it was the same gene between rats and mice and fish and frogs and all these other things. You know, well, you couldn't get a rat to breed to a frog. You couldn't get a rat to breed to a mouse. It was supposition at the time, but they said, this is the same gene. That's why Mm. they started calling all of them T negative. Now, they had some ways of being able to do it because you can test for tyrosinase in other ways. So you could take an albino rat and suck its blood out and test for the the tyrosinase gene, and you could do the same to a mouse. But, you know, before you could do that, even the supposition was, well, these look the same, so they are the same. And, you know, then as they got more complicated they could knock the gene out of an albino or they could take the gene out of an albino mouse and they could take the normal gene from a rat and put that one specific tyrosinase gene into the mouse babies. And all of a sudden all the mouse babies would turn brown because you turned the gene back on. It's a lot harder to do that when you're dealing with a snake because you have to go through the egg while it's in the mom and performing microsurgery on the mom to get into the embryo inside of the egg inside of the mom is really difficult. Whereas, you know, doing that in an embryo on a mouse and then implanting the mouse into the mouse uterus is not nearly as complicated. Um, Sorry, slight divergence there, but you know, yeah, the, the supposition factor isn't always wrong. You know, so you can, you know, they can make the comparison because they behave very much the same way. So there is a likelihood that they are the same. It's not always a guarantee. You know, it's possible that, you know, you could take an albino that, you know, one of these other albinos that looks albino, but it's really a T positive. Mm-hmm. and then breed it to another one and you get the double het animal and you're like, but I bred two albinos together. Well, it turns out what you bred together was a T plus that just looked very strongly amelanistic, but wasn't. Um, corn snakes actually is a good one. The gene for albinism in corn snakes, it is not the tyrosinase gene. They are a T positive animal, mm-hmm. but just to look at them, you would be like, oh, that's T negative. 
that's T negative all day long because there's no dark pigment to them. Well, the problem isn't a matter of whether there's dark pigment. They make the tyrosinase just fine, but somewhere along the pathway, it's it breaks the uh, a, a, a port that allows for stability of the melanosome and melanin has to be at a certain pH. Well, the melanosome can't maintain that pH, so the melanin just disintegrates and breaks down. So even though they make the melanin, it never sticks around long enough for it to actually pigment the animal. And if there were another rat snake out there that had a true T negative, you could breed an AML corn to that true T negative and you'd mm-hmm. get double hats and you'd be like, but I bred two albinos together. Well, no, actually you didn't. You bred a T positive animal to a T negative animal. And that's why it doesn't look the same. That makes sense. I enjoyed this conversation and we are getting about to the end here. And I hope we didn't lose a lot of people in our science ramblings. <laughs> I, I do truly that, don't I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if we can, give i don't know if we can make genetics simple for anyone what what would you say to i don't know the beginner that wants to start breeding what would you give them on on advice on how to wrap their head around genetics or how where to start okay slightly controversial statement but one of the first things i will tell you is the people who have been in this since the beginning do not necessarily know the most So I dare say (laughs) just because they say they know what they're talking about does not mean they know what they're talking about. Um, You know, I'm, I'm not saying you can only talk to geneticists. You know, there aren't very many true geneticists in the hobby. There's me, there's Warren Booth, there's Ben Morrill, uh, Patrick McKnight, but it's still worthwhile to find people who know what they're talking about rather than the people who are just kind of regurgitating what they think they remember from high school biology 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, You know, genetics has changed a lot. Genetics has changed a lot, you know, in the dozen odd years since I got my doctorate. You know, I keep up with this stuff because it's what... I live for it's what I do. I get bored and I read genetics papers because I'm weird, you know. Um, you know. Yeah, that's not what I do. <laughs> you know, but you don't. You don't have to be a geneticist to know it. You do have to take the time to really understand it, rather than just saying, "Well, but the textbook that I had back in 1989 or 1994 when I took biology in high school." said this so that's what it is you know Mm -hmm. do i still have my textbooks from high school yes do i actually use them as reference materials no not really i more use them as weights when i'm trying to glue something down and i need heavy weight and so i just throw that one on top of all the other textbooks that i have um so yeah the first thing would be just because somebody's been in it from the beginning doesn't necessarily know mean they know what they're talking about um How to find out what is going on out there? You're going to find a bazillion, bazillion, bazillion blogs, commenters, YouTube, you know. While they may be good at communicating thoughts, it still sometimes is more worthwhile to go to places like university websites and stuff, you know, you don't have to be in school with a university sometimes for them just to have basic genetics lessons available Mm -hmm. and find those because those at least are being put out by, you know, teachers, professors, academic students who are more familiar with it and are more familiar with the current goings on. So they'll be more likely to give you, more complete information. Um, So basically go to academia and not your reptile shop down the road. Not yeah, You're not necessarily (laughs) your reptile shop down the road. And I know a lot of people think that academia and academics, you know, we live in this ivory tower and we think we're smarter than you. And, you know, I, 
Are we smarter than you on the topic that we are specialists in? Yes. That doesn't make us arrogant any more than, you know, it's arrogant for your mechanic to say that he knows more about your car than you do because he has spent all of his life working on cars. It's not arrogant to, for your plumber to say he knows more about, you know, installing the plumbing system in your house than you because you did not go to school or train for that kind of thing. We're not arrogant. We know our field better than you because that's what we do. You know, there's a reason I don't try to rebuild the engine on my car when I have problems. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, <laughs> I go to the guys that know what they're doing. I go to the places that know what they're doing. Can I use a YouTube video to show me how to change my oil? Yes. You know, do I need to? No, because I've been changing my oil since I was 16. I know how to do that now. Um, but <clears throat> am I going to use one guy's YouTube video to replace my entire transmission? there's not a chance in hell. So why would you go to one YouTube video and think that they have just given you the beginning and the end and everything in between about genomics or genetics? They haven't. Um, you know, find the places that have that depth of expertise that you need. You know, you can get current textbooks you can get access to them online. You can go to a library. I know that libraries are these strange and abnormal places to some people these <laughs> days. You know, the World Wide Web, while it's got a lot of everything, sometimes it's hard to get access to things. I know paywalls suck. You know, reading scientific papers, you can read the abstract and think it sounds like an awesome paper and you want to read everything, but then they want you to pay $40 to read a three-page mm -hmm. write-up. You know, look at the names of the authors there there's almost always contact information for one of them. It's the lead author or, you know, the go-to author, you know, contact that person and ask them. Most of them are happy to send you that paper because that money that's being charged, that's not going to them. That's going to the publisher. Yeah, you know, they'll I didn't have even a copy. Think of they'll want to send you that paper. <laughs> they, yeah. they want that information out there as much as you want that information for you. So, don't be afraid to go to places like PubMed or Google Scholar or things like that. Find those papers, contact those authors, and ask them, you know, how can I get it? Um, you know, again, books. I know reading is not as popular these days. I don't know if there are audio books of things, but, you know, you can find good books out there on genetics, genetic topics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they can be real in depth, if that's how crazy far you want to go, but they can be real light and simple. Um, you know, fundamental concepts in biology. It's not like a brick. It's not this massive tome. It it's a little bit it's a little bit meaty, and you might have to pause every now and then when you're reading it. Um, let me let's, book your inner fish. It. Yeah. That's not a super big book right there. No, it's not. You know, it's it's an inch, an inch and a half thick. You know, a lot of it is talking about, literally, about fish, a fossil fish. But mm -hmm. it describes a lot of these, you know, at a higher idea, genetic concepts, but without having to deal with, like, the deep nitty gritties of genetics, it, you know, how skin as a precursor can form into what we consider skin, you know, on us, but also hair and feathers and scales and teeth. And, you know, so you get all these different, different looking things from one same basic precursor. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of genetics works. Uh, Endless Forms Most Beautiful by Stephen Carroll. That's another great book because he writes more towards the everyman than towards the pure academic mindset. And it explains things using real world stuff that, you know, you can think about and appreciate, you know, butterflies. It's, it's, it's a lot cooler to read about how changing a gene can change the pattern on a butterfly's wings mm -hmm. in a way that like, you know, if you change this gene, now all of a sudden butterflies get spots on their wings instead of stripes. And then the butterflies that like spotted butterflies start breeding together 
and you get a new species and it's all spotted butterflies and it's all down to one little teeny tiny change. You know, you get to understand things like that. And then these bigger, heavier meteor concepts start to become normalized to you. And then you can start thinking, oh, yeah, well, I guess I see how when Travis was saying when you combine two different mutations that take pigment away, it's not additively combining 50 and 25 to get back 75. It's taking away 25 percent of the 50 percent. So now you're only at 12 and a half percent, you know. Yeah. I wrote down those books too. I'm going to find them. <laughs> I'll probably contact you later and be like, okay, what, what more books do I need? <laughs> I have well, lots awesome. Of them. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Behind him is just a whole bookshelf is what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Travis. I really appreciate you taking this time and explaining genetics as best as you could and me trying to mesh that with the blood and short tail world. Um, if anyone wants to contact you, where can they get a hold of you? Um, so you can find me on Facebook. I am Travis Wyman. I am not the motocross racer. Don't go emailing him or messaging him about genetics questions. Cause he's not going to know what you're talking about. Um, you'll know my profile really, really, really easily. Yep. <laughs> my picture is me with a snake around my neck. So yep. <laughs> the motocross racer does not have a snake around his neck. Um, you can find me on Instagram. I am snakes underscore N underscore bakes, snakes and bakes. Um, I was the original. There's a lot of imitators out there now. I, <laughs> I, I try to take that as uh, imitation as the sincerest form of flattery. So there you go. <laughs> all the people who've decided to follow suit and do their baking and or their, their cooking and their snakes on the same pro feed, you know, I thank you for taking your inspiration from me. Um, you can also email me at asplundii, that's A-S-P-L-U-N-D-I-I -I, at gmail.com. Awesome. And realize that where I work, I don't have access to the outside internet for things like Facebook and personal email and stuff during the day. So it may take me a while to get back to you. It's not that I'm ignoring you. It's that I'm just, you know, locked up in my little dark cave at work. And so... <laughs> Little I may not get to you until the you? evening, <laughs> and when I get home, evening, a lot of time for me is family time and stuff, so it may take me a day or two to get back to you, but I will still endeavor to get back to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very, very much. If any of you guys have any further questions about blood python genetics, there are many group experts in the blood python group on Facebook, and we can guide you in the right direction. I am not a pro on ZigZag. I am not a pro on Slackline. And there are things that I did not even mention in this podcast. So uh, kind of the possibilities are endless here. So if you uh, have more questions on that, be sure to reach out to me or anyone else in the blood python group. Uh, there's a mentorship program on there as well. You can hook yourself up with a mentor and get any of your questions answered. Now, instead of plugging that <laughs> Facebook group as much as I just have, um, I will end it at that. Thank you again, Travis. I appreciate it very much. And no that problem. is Thank you for episode, having me. Absolutely. That's episode three in the books. Thanks everyone for listening. Please feel free to give me a follow on Facebook and Instagram at Bloods by Design. Tag me in your blood python photos at Bloods by Design, hashtag strictly shorties, so I can share all the awesome animals you listeners have. And if you have any questions, people you want to hear from, or topics to discuss, you can email those to bloodsbydesign at gmail.com. And of course, this podcast is supported by the NPR Network. If you want to get a hold of any of the guys at the NPR Network, you can email them at info at MoreliaPythonRadio.com. You can follow them on all the socials and, of course, subscribe to the NPR Network YouTube channel. They have a Patreon where you can support all the NPR podcasts, just like this one, as well as merch. And all of that can be found on their website, MoreliaPythonRadio.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll catch you next month for more Strictly Shorties.